I've been asked to do some further mechanics questions by one of my viewers, so I'm going to have a go at a couple of them, one on circular motion and one on momentum, so that it gives you an idea of the sort of things that can come up. The first one is on circular motion. One thing I will say about this question is that something very similar to this came up a few years ago in the home A level. This is from the IAL. And so my advice would be, if you're doing IAL, do practice the past papers from the home A-level too, because these do come up. And if you're doing home A-level, then keep your eye on the IAL papers, because there's a lot of overlap. Okay, so here we have a Troy car that's coming down this track, and we need to establish that if it is released from 25 centimeters above point A, which is up here, is it going to be able to stay on the track and go all the way around from A to C and around to D. And we've got some information here on the mass of the car and how high C is above A. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to remind ourselves that these all have to be in our SI units, meters and kilograms. So we're just going to write those in there. There's a minimum speed that a car has to have at C in order to stay on the track and not fall off. And that minimum speed is the speed where the centripetal force required to keep it in the circle is equal to its weight. It can go faster than that, at which point the normal contact force will kick in and help, but if it's going slower than that, it's going to fall off. So at point C, that V squared, that V, represents the absolute slowest it can be. Now, obviously, it's getting that speed from the fact that it started at a height up here and is coming rolling down. So its GPE at this point is going to get converted to kinetic energy down here. Now, some of that kinetic energy is going to get converted back into GPE to get up to C, which means the kinetic energy of the car at A has got to be equal to whatever kinetic energy it has at C plus any GPE that is lost in getting from A to C. So that's what we're going to establish. We're going to establish how much energy does it, kinetic energy does it have at A. And to do that, we first need its speed at C. So we're going to use this equation that I've put up here and find out what its speed at C is. And if we do a little rearranging here, we'll see that the speed is going to be the square root of g times r. And that's going to give you 1.04 meters per second. Okay, so let's see how much kinetic energy that then means. As we know, kinetic energy is half mv squared. We know we have half times 33 times 10 to the minus 3 times our 1.04 squared. That gives us a kinetic energy of 0.0178 joules up there at the top at C. It must have that much kinetic energy, otherwise it's going to fall. Its kinetic energy at A has got to be that plus the GPE between the two. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate how much gravitational potential energy it took to get up between A and C. So our 33 times G times, and they tell us that the distance here is 22 centimeters. That gives us a GPE of 0 0.0712, and we're going to add these two together. That plus that, giving a total of 0 0.089 joules. Okay, so that's how much kinetic energy the car must have at A in order to get up to C and still have enough speed to stay on the loop. It gets that energy from coming down this first track. And obviously it had gravitational potential energy at the top of the track, and that's going to get converted into kinetic energy. So if it's going to stay on the track, the gravitational potential energy that it had up at the top has got to be equal to that. So let's do a little calculation and see if it is. Again, we just put in our numbers. This time we know it's released from 25 centimeters, giving a total of 0 0.0809 joules. Now look at these two. 
This is how much it has at the start. This is how much it needs. Those are not equal. It needs more than it's getting. So, no. If you release it from 25, it is not going to stay on the track. The second question I'm going to do today involves momentum. And this is actually very relevant to something that happened recently. This is about deflecting the path of an asteroid that is coming close to the Earth. And the first part of it gives you some blurb about colliding a spacecraft into the surface of the asteroid to change the path. They would remain joined after the collision. So when they tell you that, that gives you clues about some things. First of all, if they're joined together after, we know it's an inelastic collision. So if at any point we're going to have to calculate kinetic energy, we know it's not going to be conserved. Also, we know afterwards, if we need to use the mass of the object after, it's the combined mass of the two objects before. Okay, this collision method is modeled for a spacecraft traveling in a direction 90 degrees to the path of the asteroid. Sketch a labeled vector diagram to show the moment of the bodies before and after the collision. Okay, we don't have any information as of yet of how much that is, so it's not a scale diagram. But we can draw, there's the asteroid, and that's its momentum going across that there. You can draw it vertically, you can draw it horizontally, that's entirely up to you. But we know that the spacecraft is going to come in at 90 degrees here. And when it does that, we know it's going to deflect the path of the asteroid to some point upwards, this way. So we know that our resultant is going to be somewhere like this. But of course, with a vector diagram, we should always be drawing them tip to tail. So we do not draw our vector down there at the bottom. We are drawing our vector from the tail of the vector is there, and it comes up like that. And this is our spacecraft. And then this is our combined asteroid and spacecraft afterwards. Show that the momentum of the spacecraft is about 10 to the 7 newton seconds. This, of course, is an alternative unit for momentum. Normally we would put the unit as kilograms meters per second, but newton seconds does just as well because that is impulse, which is the same as change in momentum. This looks very straightforward. We are just calculating the momentum, which is mass times velocity, so we're going to go 920 times 12,000, giving us a momentum of 1.104 times 10 to the 7 kilograms meters per second, or newton seconds. So far, so good. Show that this collision method causes the asteroid to change its direction through an angle of about that many radians. First things first, we put our calculator in radians if it's not in there already. Now let's go back to our vector diagram. We had asteroid, we had spacecraft, and we had resultant. And now we've got 1.104 times 10 to the 7 is our momentum over there. And 7.6 times 10 to the 13 is our momentum there, and we want this angle. And of course, as soon as you start labeling that, you realize that we're going for tan theta is 1.104 times 10 to the 7. And of course, it's always better to use your calculated value rather than the given value. You won't be penalized for using the given value, but examiners always say it's best practice to use the calculated value. 7.6 times 10 to the 13, that gives us an angle of 1.45 times 10 to the minus 7 radians, as we were asked to do. After the collision, they remain joined and move together, calculate the component of their velocity at 90 degrees to the original path. Now, this is quite awkwardly phrased. Remember that this is our resultant here, right? And we've got our angle theta that goes in there. We want the component at 90 degrees to the original. So that's the original direction, that horizontal line. The component at 90 degrees, of course, is our momentum of 1.104 times 10 to the 7. So what we need to do is turn that momentum into a velocity. And we do that, of course, by dividing by the mass. It tells us again that they're joined and moved together, so we have to use their combined mass. And so we would go 1.104 times 10 to the 7 is going to be equal to 2.8 times 10 to the 9. And the mass of our asteroid, sorry, our spacecraft was 920 times V, giving us a V of 3.94 times 10 to the minus 3 meters per second. 
And of course, it should be very small, because we know that this angle, that it got turned off its original path, was very small, meaning we're going to have a very small component of our velocity in that vertical direction. Another method would involve attaching a motor and using the motor to apply a force. In this method, the force is applied at 90 degrees, so the same situation. Deduce whether this would produce a change in momentum as great as the change produced by the collision method. This one is basically testing that you know that change in momentum is equal to impulse, which is force times time. And of course, this is our force. And our time should be in seconds, so at the moment it's in minutes, we just change that into seconds. That gives us a change in momentum of 1.84 times 10 to the 9 newton seconds, or kilograms meters per second. Now for a lot of students, the temptation is to leave it there because they say to themselves, well that's obviously bigger than the one that we had before. But if you do that, you're going to lose out on that second mark. You have to point that out. So you're going to say that is greater than 1.104 times 10 to the 7. And so therefore, this produces a greater change in momentum. How do you know that you have to do that? This is the keyword, deduce. Anytime you see that, you know you've got to compare the numbers that you had before and then make a conclusion at the bottom.